What's up, Real Life family? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We are excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life. And we believe that that day could be today. We would love it if you would share this experience. Click on the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about that time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. I want to say hello to those joining us online. We have an incredible team that serves online, by the way, and I want to give them a shout out. Thank you guys for serving there. Also, uh, those at Hunter Creek, great to have you joining us. Good to see you. Good morning. Thanks for being with us here on Palm Sunday. Uh, we're in Easter week. We're excited. We can't wait to worship you this weekend. We've been in a series called He Is, I Am, if you're just joining us. And uh, if we never met, my name is Mark. I am the campus pastor here. I have the joy of being uh, one of the, part of the teaching team and under the leadership of Justin Miller. We've been in a series called He Is, I Am, where we've been looking at seven statements that Jesus makes uniquely about himself. And these are so powerful for us, whether you're a believer, whether you are agnostic, you just don't know, or whether you're an atheist, these are the seven statements you wanna press into because this is where Jesus really distinguishes himself from just being a prophet, from just being a teacher. He is establishing himself as the Messiah, the one who comes to save the world from sin. And every week we've been unpacking what that means for who he is, and then also what it means for us as his followers. And this week we're gonna be looking at, well today we're gonna be looking at, I am the true vine. Everybody say true vine. Come on, say it together, true vine. Now does anyone love gardening? Anyone love to garden? Okay, good. You have to really love it if you do it in Florida because of this heat. You have to really love to want to be out there in Florida under these conditions. I grew up in the South Bronx, so because I grew up in the South Bronx, we didn't have the right surroundings to have a garden. Uh, uh, you know, concrete jungle, right? Fences, buildings. We see a tree every once in a while, but most of all, we, we just didn't have areas. That didn't stop my mom. My mom loves gardening, and even though we just had concrete everywhere, she made our apartment into a garden. She had plants everywhere, and I'm not talking about like the sweet little home decor plants that you could just move very easily or you could bend the branches. I'm talking about the really, really big ones. You know, the like grandma used to have with the giant pot filled with soil, and if you tipped it over, it was going to be a big old mess in your house. And those are the plants she did, and she would talk to them, and she would love on them. She would, she would just caress the leaves and just tell them how beautiful they were and those things would just take up space and, and they would grow full and large and she would just care and nurture for those. I didn't know, I, I didn't know anything about plants, but I, what I did know is that they grew under my mom's care. I just went to see her a couple days ago and she still got plants everywhere, growing beautifully. Here's what I know about my own personal life. Growth doesn't just happen. Growth just doesn't happen, not automatically. You need someone outside of you to help you grow. That's what I found in my own life. And the same way my mom loved on plants and wanted to see them grow and she would nurture and care for them, the, the, the sum of the message is this, Jesus wants to be that for you. He wants to be the one who watches over you, who waters you, who cares for you, and that ultimately because of your relationship with him, you begin to grow as well. That's why he comes making the statement that he is the true vine. He wants to help us understand what he's there to offer. Now, the other part of this, before we look at John chapter 15, that's really important for our understanding what Jesus is saying when Jesus says, I am, he is making a bold declaration that he is eternal. Like when Moses and the burning bush, Moses had this encounter with God and he said, who shall I say sent me? When God sent Moses to his people, God said, tell them I am that I am. 
In other words, I'm internally who I am. I have no beginning and no end. So every time Jesus is trying to use a picture and a metaphor to help his disciples and us understand who he is and what he provides, he is telling us, I I, I come to save you, but you have to know that I'm eternally God and that everything I have for you, I could supply for you eternally. It's not going to run out in every claim and every statement. So as he makes this claim, I am the true vine, he is telling us his deity. He is telling us that he is almighty God, the ancient of days, the bright morning star. He was there at the very beginning, and here he is revealing himself in the mystery of a person, God coming to us, revealing all of who he is in the person of Jesus Christ, and he's saying, I want to provide for you as the vine. So let's take a look. John chapter 15. This is our anchor verses as we jump in. You guys ready? Okay. John chapter 15 verses one through eight. I'm going to read it. You can read along with me. I am the true vine. Everybody say true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will even be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Everybody say remain. Remain. Come on, say it again. Everybody say remain. remain. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit and apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is about to head to the cross. In the context of what we're reading, he is spending his last moments with the disciples, and he's trying to pass off to them as much encouragement and wisdom as he can, because for the first time in their life, they are going to have to follow God without Jesus physically being there. They've gotten used to him being around. They've gotten used to him solving problems, performing miracles, answering their questions about God and salvation. And now he knows he's leaving the earth and he's trying to help them understand the relationship we've had so far can continue to happen, but now it's going to have to continue to happen by faith. And this is exactly where we are today. We have a relationship with God through Christ by faith. And the disciples were going to face trials and testings, and they were going to face situations that would cause them to contemplate other alternatives, right? When when pressure comes, when life gets difficult, we just start to wonder, should I stay? Should I remain? Or should I look for something else? It's like if you've ever gone to Chick-fil-A when you're really, really hungry, And you drive into Chick-fil-A, and the line is like super long, and you're like, I got to get my Christian chicken, you know what I'm saying? I I, I got to get it in my soul. And you're just there, and the line is so long, you're like, oh, I don't have enough time to wait here. And then you start thinking, should I go over there? I don't know. You know, the lunch is not going to be as good, but if I stay here, it's almost too long. Anybody know what I'm talking about? By the way, let me make a correction, because last week, my buddy Chuck Babino was here. And uh, he made a bold claim about Popeye's chicken sandwich. Now, I've had Popeye's chicken sandwich, and I can go for some Popeye's every once in a while. But listen, I don't know what they do in Mount Dora, but in Claremont, the Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich is still king. I'm just going to set the record straight. I love you, Chuck. Enjoy your Popeye's chicken sandwich. But let's just get it right. All right, so you're in Chick-fil-A, and you're waiting a long time, and you just start wondering, should I wait? Should I go? Maybe this happens when you're on the highway. This happens to me all the time. If I'm on a long trip, ask Pastor Jay, ask Pastor Mike. When we go on a long road trip, and we're coming back, and I'm driving, I go complete New York on the car. I'm like, I want to go from lane to lane. I just got to get home. If this lane ain't moving fast enough, I'm jumping to this one. I'm jumping to that one back and forth. When, when we are in a situation where we feel stuck, 
when we are in a situation where we feel like things are not going the way we want them to be, we start to contemplate our options. We start looking, should I stay or should I go? And this is exactly where the disciples were as they were about to be tempted to walk away from Jesus. And we face the same temptation when things get hard. We face the very same temptation when life gets hard, life gets difficult, and we go, should I just continue to follow God? Does it even make sense anymore? And Jesus, knowing what was ahead of them, was trying to encourage them by saying, I am the true vine. I am the true vine, and I will be there for you. You have to believe me, and you have to trust me. Now, this term, the vine, comes from the Old Testament. If you've read the Old Testament, which I love the Old Testament, for the believers during Jesus' time, they would have only known the Old Testament. They would have only known the, prophets, the promises of God, even for salvation, through the Old Testament scriptures. And in the Old Testament, the people of Israel were called the vine. They were called the vine because God poetically took them out of Egypt, he plucked them out of Egypt, and he planted them in a new land of promise. And he planted them there because he wanted to see them grow, he wanted them to be his people, and he wanted them to be fruitful. And over the scriptures, and I'm going to give you these if you'd like to have some extra study, Isaiah chapter 5 gives a whole description on the vine, talking about the people of Israel and God's relationship with them and how he wanted them to grow. Psalm 80 also talks about it. Hosea chapter 10. And you've probably heard at some point or read at some point the parable of the vineyard in both Matthew and Luke, where Jesus gives illustrations and he uses the kingdom of God to talk about this vineyard, that God planted this vineyard and he sent prophets and he sent teachers and he gives this story of this vine that for whatever reason, it just can't grow fruitful. God planted it, God took care of it, he blessed it and they walked away. Then God delivered it, God planted it and he blessed it and they it walked away. Does it sound familiar to anybody? I know in my own life, when I've had the most pain and most struggle, those are the seasons where I sought God the most. But to be honest, when things are really, really good and there's blessing, it's really hard to stay faithful to God because we start to get this notion that we can grow and be fruitful on our own. And the truth is, for us, if we're going to be fruitful, it can only happen if we remain in Christ if we remain in his word, if we remain close to his love, if we remain in his grace, all those things that only Jesus brings, if we stay connected to him, we can be faithful and fruitful. Maybe you're here today, and I don't know how long you've been trying to serve God, but have you ever just wanted to serve God and just failed at it? You just had a bad day, you had a bad week, you're having a bad year, you're just like, I wanna serve God, I wanna be faithful, but I just can't get it right. Every time I try to do it, I don't do right. Anybody? You just feel like I wanted to start off this year on fire for God. I wanted to have all these spiritual goals in my life, and yet I find that there's just constant weakness. Jesus said what? He said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's something about us in our own ability where we just fall short. There's a quote that I've written in my journal and even as I read it to you today, it still ministers to me. Thomas Kempis, he said this, be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. Isn't that true? Like, I would love to change things about certain people around me. I really would. But the truth is, I cannot change things about my own personality right now. Like, I wish with a Thanos snap that I could just do it and it's changed, that I'm not going to overreact to this thing. I'm not going to get frustrated by that. I'm not going to feel negative emotions. I'm not going to have these highs or lows. But the reality is it's there. And what that means for me is that I don't have the power to change me. I don't have the power to transform me. The only one who can do that is Christ. I have to rely on Christ and I have to cling to him, knowing that one day that the work he started, he will finish. I can't finish it. It's not my job to finish it. It's my job to trust that he will finish it, that I have to stay in him. A branch cannot produce fruit on its own. And so Jesus, knowing the history of Israel, knowing that the people of Israel struggled 
to serve God faithfully. They struggled to follow God. They struggled to obey God. All the same struggles that we face. He says, I am the true vine. Knowing in their minds what he's referring to. The way it used to be, you had to, everything to be in relationship with God was dependent on you. That's how it was. Jesus comes with good news. He goes, it's no longer dependent on you. It's dependent on me. I am the true vine. And through me, because I am eternal, because I won't fail, if you have a relationship with me, you will remain connected to God because you're connected to me. The branch connected to the vine. Jesus brings really good news that the power of God is accessible to me. A relationship with God is available to me. Real change can happen in me, but only through him. He brings good news in the reality of what we've all discovered and that to be human is to struggle. To be human is to be a person who tries their best but realizes they always fall short in some capacity. And the good news is that Jesus is here to offer himself as the true vine. My first point for us is this, and we gotta get this in our soul. We gotta get this in our hearts as believers of Christ. We exist to bear fruit. If you're wondering why God has saved you, if you're wondering is there a purpose for my life, yes, there's a purpose and plan for your life. And the purpose and plan for your life as a branch is to bear fruit. John chapter 15, verse 16, as Jesus continues talking in the same chapter, he says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. The purpose of your life and my life is to bear fruit. We exist to bear fruit. Have you ever seen invisible fruit? Anybody? No, because it doesn't exist. We know that logically, right? I have invisible fruit. Uh, The evidence of growth is fruit. In fact, let's say that together because I really want to stick on this for a minute. The evidence of growth. Come on, say it together. All upstairs, downstairs together. The evidence of growth is is fruit. Say it together one more time. The evidence of growth is fruit. So let's say I go over to your house and I love mangoes. I love mangoes. So you go, oh man, you love mangoes. I got a mango tree in the back, bro. Go back there and take whatever you want. And I go, awesome. I go back there. I see this beautiful tree. It's tall. It's full. It's got branches. It's got green leaves. And I'm searching. And I look up and down and I go, this thing ain't got no mangoes. And I go, is this the tree? Yes, that's the tree. And I'm like, you would doubt that it's a mango tree. Am I I correct? You would be like, either this isn't a mango tree, or you gone and ate them all before you told me to come grab one. One of those has to be true, but they both can't simultaneously be true. Why? Because the evidence of growth is fruit. The evidence of growth is? Okay, so let's say a guy stops, you know, I'm walking down the street, and he goes, yo, my guy, I got something for you. I got an egg tree for you. And I go, what? An egg tree, my guy. I got an egg tree. It produces eggs. Because eggs are so expensive, I found a way for a tree to produce eggs. (laughs) And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, I'm serious, dude. I got a tree that's going to make eggs for you. I'm like, well, I love me some eggs. Scrambled eggs, sunny side up, whatever you got. I'm down for it. What do I need to do? Easy. Take it to your backyard. Get it to a spot where it has good soil, get sunlight, you water it, and it's going to produce eggs for you, guaranteed, six months. All right, let me get it. I take it, I put it in my house, I'm excited, I'm watering the thing, I'm making sure all the, all the surroundings are right, I'm checking on it, month goes by, two months go by, I'm excited, I'm ready, three months, four months, five months, six months. Now, the tree has grown. The tree is taller, and there's more branches, and there's way more leaves, but guess what? Ain't no eggs. Ain't no eggs. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call my guy, and I'm going to be like, my dude, you duped me. I've been bamboozled. 
you gave me a tree. You didn't give me an egg tree. You just gave me a plain old tree. And he goes, no, 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 it's an egg tree. And I say, it's not an egg tree. Why? Because the evidence of growth is fruit. If there's no fruit, you're actually not growing. See, a tree can grow tall. You can say it's an orange tree. You can say it's a mango tree. You can say it's an egg tree. And it could be tall, and it could have branches, and it could have leaves. But if it doesn't produce fruit, there's no evidence of growth. Because the Bible's very clear. We exist to bear fruit. When God says, I want you to grow, he's just not telling you to grow as a tall, green, leafy plant. He's telling you to grow spiritually, that there's fruit and evidence in your life. And this is hard for us to hear, but we got to be reminded by it. I got to run it by us again because I love you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Let me remind us what spiritual fruit looks like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, that's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's spiritual fruit. That's what the Word of God says. That's what should be growing on the branches of our lives. You know what the world is filled with? Rotten fruit. The world is filled with bitter fruit, angry fruit. I mean, angry, yelling at the top of my lungs fruit, slanderous fruit, gossiping fruit, tearing you down, canceling people fruit. That's the fruit of the culture of the world. Jesus says, if you just stay attached to me, you won't taste like that. If you just stay attached to me, if anything pokes you, if anything bites you, if anything wounds you, what comes out of you will be the fruit of the Spirit. If you just remain in me. And as you look at this list, listen, I'm with you. Because when I preach the word, I'm preaching to myself first. I put myself in submission to God's word first as a messenger. And I realize this has to apply to me very, at the very first before I could bring it to anyone else. I look at that list and I go, that's almost impossible. That's like, how can I be fruitful under those conditions? You ever get off the turnpike and 50s all the way backed up? Try being patient. Doesn't work. Okay, you get up in the morning, you need coffee, and you go to Starbucks, and they mess up your coffee drink. Try being loving. Try to be loving right there when the barista is trying their very best, and they go on and messed up your coffee, right? Almost impossible, okay? Someone yelling at you, right in your face, try to be gentle. Try to be gentle. Why? It doesn't work. Why? Because we've discovered that there's something flawed in our own nature. It's unnatural for us to do it. So while we are called to be fruitful, that's very clear. The passages we read, Jesus says, I want you to bear fruit, and I want you to be very fruitful. We see what the fruit is, but then we go like, but how? How can I be fruitful? And this is the good news. This is the good news of Jesus, because Christianity isn't about trying. It's about trusting. It's not about what I do. It's about what he's Done. And the reality for me is moving beyond my struggle into surrender. Half the time, I'm just fighting God. Half the time, God is trying to do the work. I'm just fighting him all the way. I'm kicking and screaming because I don't want to change. I don't want to surrender to him. And he goes, if you just let me do it. So here's, so we're called to bear fruit. That's my first point. My second point is good news. Jesus produces fruit in us. Jesus is the one who does it. You're not the one who's going to do it. Jesus is the one who's going to do it. Look at two passages of scripture so I can bring this home for you. Philippians chapter 1 verses 10 and 11, that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes what? Through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. The fruit of righteousness in my life and your life doesn't happen through your effort. It happens through Christ. It happens through me surrendering to him doing the work. If I just remain, if Jesus is in it, fruit will come from it. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. 
If I've surrendered my life to Christ, I have to let him do his job. Every need of the vine, every need of the branch is supplied by the vine. And God will finish what he started. That's his promise. God will finish what he started. And this is the good news because he won't fail. He won't stop. He won't quit pursuing you. Religion says you have to do it. Try harder. Be better. Get up earlier. Read more of the word. Give more. Do more. Be more. That's what religion says. Jesus says, no, no, no. If you will just stay connected to me, the fruit will automatically come because you remain in me and I remain in you. It'll automatically spring up. Jesus produces the fruit in us. There's a saying we all have, right? Won't he do it? Anybody heard that phrase? Won't he do it? Yeah, here's my phrase. Let him do it. Let him do it. He'll do it. But if you get in the way, you're stopping him from doing his work. He wants to produce righteousness in you. He wants to produce fruit. It's there. Just let him do his work. We exist to bear fruit. And we, exist, and we exist to bear fruit, and Jesus produces fruit in us. And then he throws this bonus on top of it. He says that the Father is the gardener. Now, for all of those who love gardening, you know, you grab your little tool, little snips, and you go right out there, and you look for the stuff that doesn't belong. You look over your plants, you look over your flowers, and you go, that's, nope, that's not growing right. Let me cut that off. That looks like it's turning out rotten. Let me snip that. Let me take that off. And this is the role of the Father. The Father, because you are in Christ, will take a look at the totality of your life, and he's going to start removing stuff from your life. And this is painful. This is very, very painful, especially when you're used to things, and you're used to maybe possessions. Maybe you're used to just certain people in your life, and God starts removing these things. This is what we call the pruning process. But you have to remember what Jesus says. The ones who bear fruit, God prunes so that they could be more what? Fruitful. So the reason for pruning is that you are already producing fruit. God sees your potential to be fruitful. So he says, oh, this, this plant is growing beautiful and lovely. But if I don't remove all these things right now, it'll stay exactly where it is. So I'm going to prune things back. I'm going to cut things back so that it can start to grow even more fruitful. And we can trust the Father's hands. He's the master surgeon. He knows exactly where to put the knife to cut out the things that don't bring him glory. That's his job. His job is to get in our business and take out the stuff that won't ultimately bring him glory. When I had a season, uh, you know, I had a season one time where it was really, really low, and I felt like all these things were happening to me, and I had a friend just tell me this, and you've probably heard it. This isn't happening to you. It's happening for you. And I want to remind you today that it's not happening to you. It's happening for you. If you're in a pruning season, God has something in store for you, but he's going to prune things back before things can grow. Because of growth, he's going to cause it to grow even more. That's his promise. We exist to bear fruit. Jesus produces fruit in us. And then my final point is that good fruit pleases God. The people of Israel wanted to please God. They wanted to serve God. They want to follow God. And I would venture to believe all of us who come to church, all of us who are part of church, all of us who are part of Christianity, we want the same things. I want to please God. I want to serve God. I want to follow God, just like the people of Israel. But their faith was rooted in their efforts. Our faith is rooted in the vine, which is Jesus and this is what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Good fruit pleases God. Verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. God wants your life to be pleasing. He wants you to produce fruit. Jesus is divine. If you stay connected to him, that fruit will grow. But here's what I also know about plants. What I've learned over the years, God knows exactly what soil to put you in for you to grow. He knows exactly the environment you need to be in for you to grow. 
Just like a gardener, if we get a new plant, we're not gonna go to our yards and look around and there's a broken sprinkler here and there's shade so there's no sunlight so I'm gonna put a beautiful plant there. No, we wouldn't do that. We would look at our yard and we go, okay, this is a great location. The soil looks healthy, plenty of sunlight, and there's water that can reach to this location. So let me plant here. God will plant you in seasons. Maybe you're planted right now and you're wondering why in the world is all this happening? And God is saying, it's happening because only in this soil can I get you to grow and produce fruit. Only in these circumstances and situations will fruit begin to grow from your life. And that's what pleases the Lord. The key to producing fruit is staying connected to the vine. We don't like to stay. We want to find alternatives to staying. Jesus is saying, if you just stay, if you just trust, if you will just wait on me, I will do the work for you. So the question is, are you growing or are you resisting growth? Is your soul unhappy because God is in there, he's trying to produce something in you and the Father's trying to cut something out and you're just resisting all of that? These are the questions we got to look at as we look at Jesus, who is the true vine. He wants to provide everything. Am I trusting? Am I trying? Am I striving or am I surrendered? Am I growing or am I resisting his hands? Maybe it's just a part of your life that you're resisting God. Maybe in your parenting, you feel like you depend on God entirely. I can't parent my kids. I need the Lord to raise my kids. So you're surrendered there. But maybe in your marriage, you're doing it on your own. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe there's just one part of your life where you go like, I can do this on my own, Jesus. I actually don't need you here. And the truth is for you and me, we can grow things. We've had years without knowing Jesus, and we were able to do things and accomplish things. There's no denying that, but you can't produce fruit. Jesus says, in order for you to, to produce fruit, you can do nothing fruitful outside of me. It has to be connected to me. Are you staying connected to him, or are you going back to trusting yourself like the people of Israel did? They failed, they were discouraged, and they were ready to walk away. And maybe you're there today, and Jesus is here saying, you don't have to do that. If you could just learn to trust, if you could just learn to surrender, am I going to remain? Am I going to react? Am I going to try on my own, or am I going to learn to trust? In fact, let me just pray that over you before you leave today. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the word that you are the true vine. And that you show us through your word very clearly that your plan for us to be fruitful as your disciples, to be fruitful as your followers, does not depend on how long I've been coming to church. It doesn't depend how long I've been reading the word. It doesn't depend on anything that I do. It depends entirely on what Jesus has done. That's our reminder today. He is the true vine. We are the branches. And apart from him, there can be no fruit. There can be no growth. And so, Lord, I pray for all of your sons and daughters here who want to serve you, who want to know you, who want to follow you, who want their lives to taste like you, especially in this season. Holy Spirit, would you give them the revelation that trying in their own effort is not the answer, but trusting in what Christ has done is. That you would move us beyond our struggle and our striving into surrender. Lord, would you do the work? And yes, we believe that you can do it, but Lord, we come with open hearts and we say, Lord, we want to let you do it. We want to give you the space to do the work. Help me to accept your help. Help me to accept your hand as you go through the garden of my soul and you remove the things that do not bring you glory. I pray that all of us, me included, would be able to serve you, know you, and follow you and remain in you as you remain in us and that we would produce good fruit that brings glory to your name. And we ask that in Jesus's name. And everybody said,
Thanks for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this video encourages you. As part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer or would like to get connected to any of the resources we've mentioned, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you would like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for spending part of the day with us. We want you to know that God loves you, we love you, and we'll see you next time.